Mm -hmm. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, Toby. And you're in. <laughs> where, where, actually, where actually are you? I'm in uh, Monaco right now. In, in Monaco, the and then Alex Rose in Chicago mornings. I think the morning. Oh, okay, yes, it's morning. We have, we have uh, Toby right with us. Uh, Toby is a, a fine art artist, uh, an adventurer. He came with us for several trips, including Orcas. Uh, Sunny and Run last year was okay, you know, and then he was first <laughs> as an artist on the Elysium uh, artist for the Arctic Expedition in 2015. So now we're going to hear from Alex. Oh yes, it's bio time. Obligatory bio reading time. Get ready. And we already got a crowd waiting, just looking at uh, looking at uh, on Facebook. Oh, do we? All yes. right. Well, I'll try to be extra bad at this this morning. It'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> So, direct from the website, here we go. Right. Finding his early inspiration in the natural world, uh, Toby Wright developed a wide range of subjects uh, along with the study of the old masters in Florence. Following his Bachelor of Arts degree in illustration from the UK, he traveled to Italy where he graduated and taught at the Florence Academy of Art. He teaches various workshops and occasionally is a guest instructor at all three branches of the Florence Academy of Art. Spending as much time painting outdoors as indoors, he paints from life for his landscapes and in the studio for his figurative work. His most recent commission is a historic 13-person group portrait for Monaco's Oceanographic Museum. His love for nature has led him to unique places. As an artist aboard the Elysium Artists for the Arctic Expedition, Toby painted in the extreme conditions of Svalbard, Greenland, and Iceland. With a passion for working from life, he engages directly with nature. Whether snorkeling with orca and hemp whales in the Arctic waters of Norway or drawing underwater with the sea lions in the Sea of Cortez, he continues to search and expand his vision of where painting will take him next. And there you have it. So thanks for joining us and coordinating all of these different time zones. And, yeah, uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. And, you it's know, great. shutting down every street around you just so you can do this. I'm just yeah. <laughs> So, all right. <laughs> well, should be good. So, um, yeah, I guess we will be off to it. So, if you want to yeah, share your screen um, and tell us what you're going to be chatting with us about, that'd be uh, fabulous. I'm going to go over sort of um, an overview of where where I've come from, painting wise. How um, how I met you guys, uh, the Elysium, um, on the Elysium trip to the uh, to the Arctic. Uh, now let's see, I'm going to share a screen. <laughs> right. Wait so, for the magic. <laughs> yeah. Share that one. There okay. we go. And if I press play, is that good? Yep, that's it good. is. Yep. There we yep. go. Great. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing this wrong. <laughs> Are you surprised it worked? <laughs> Yeah, always refreshing when tech cooperates. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm going to go through several different things like the Arctic, um, uh, drawing sea lines, and also the, the broader context I've started to understand of how art and con how, um, science and conservation and art have been working together for, for quite some time. Um, I don't know where I was going to start with, but I decided to start with um, one of my favorite paintings from the Oceanographic Museum here in Monaco. Uh, growing up here, I spent a lot of time um, in, uh, in this museum. And this I'll come back to later, but uh, we, we uh, went past uh, this area. We were quite close to this area when we were up in Svalbard. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the Oceanographic Museum where I spent a lot of my, a lot of my childhood. Um, mostly drawing fish. Um, from an early age, I was fascinated with the natural sciences. And actually, just recently, I've been looking through some of my old, my old sketchbooks. And these are some of my earliest drawings that had any relevance to um, wildlife. So these are the sketches I'd be doing in my sketchbook. Um, and going to the aquariums, I had this exclusive, um, I, I was very lucky basically to have this sort of um, access to the aquariums there where I would draw um, everything and anything, um, starting with the, with the slowest moving animal. So uh, Caribbean, giant Caribbean eels were pretty perfect. And like really quite in-depth drawings, um, sketching skeletons, um, interested basically just uh, sort of 
getting getting as much information uh, from the things I loved. This is um I think this is a false orca on the left and a real orca on the on the oh, right. Okay. Um, and uh, little did I know that I'd be swimming with these guys with you. Um, <laughs> years later. Well, the guy on the right, anyway. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, the natural sciences were always, always an interest uh, for me. Um, and it continued into my higher education when I was in London. Uh, I would spend most weekends sketching at the Natural History Museum. And Natural History Museums also attracted me to my first love, which is dinosaurs, obviously. Um, any, any little boy is- Obviously. <laughs> um, this was the one in the museum in London. Uh, but the building itself, I don't know if either of you have been to the Natural History Museum uh, in London. I mean, yes. yes um, I think that. The building itself is a work of art. It's, mm -hmm. um, and I spent hours there just a few, few years ago drawing some views inside there. And you, the more you look around the building inside, the more you find little details. Um, and really, the, the building itself is as beautiful as everything it contains. Um, it really creates a sort of visual display of how science and art are interacting together. And this brings me to uh, my earliest job of art and science, which was, you might not know what desmocytes are, but <laughs> desmocytes are little cells that anchor the skin of coral to the skeleton of coral. And because I knew people at the Oceanographic Museum, this was around when I was 19 or 20 at university. And um, I was asked to actually help out. These are photographs uh, through an electron microscope of all these different things that they wanted me to illustrate with one single picture. And so this ended up being my illustration for everything they were trying to cram into all that information. And this is a, this is a science report. Um, this was led by Leonard Muscatine. And I remember mentioning his name when I was in the Arctic to, um, to Cavill, who was uh, one of our science right. um, guys. And he knew, him, he knew him well from UCLA. It was just kind of funny to, to bring up random detail like that. <laughs> that is anyway, my science, uh, my, um, that was pretty much it. That was my science and art collaboration over uh, for another uh, decade. <laughs> That's it. Bye. Uh, no. <laughs> um, continued uh, studying illustration, but then I went to Florence to learn painting at a, at a, a higher level. Um, this is where I, I came to understand the sort of larger context of painting within the framework of history. Um, and I was taught the fundamentals of understanding light, form, design, color, anatomy. Portraiture was the, the end sort of goal with the school, but you have to go through still life. And you have to go through studying all sorts of different examples of how light is falling across forms. Landscape obviously is, a, is an important part of understanding light as well. So spending time outdoors. This is how I was ready for the Arctic trip to actually be outside um, and paint under, under sort of inconvenient, um, inconvenient conditions. And all those things come together to sort of help the painter create their own uh, project. So with the understanding of how to work uh, rocks and still life objects and the human figure and skin and portrait, the idea is that you, know, you want to try and accumulate all these, all these different sets of tools to be able to then control um, a much more personal uh, project that ends up being um, ends up being you know on a personal theme. So this was actually a life size draw, uh, life size painting. Um, the painting couldn't even fit in the frame uh, of, the, of the photograph for the for the picture. Um, this was this was in Monaco. I was I was presenting this painting at a show and got a um, a prize. And uh, Prince Albert here. Prince Albert II of Monaco was coming along. See, the painting was so big that it actually makes you feel you need to put your arm around the back of it as if it's a person in the same room. It's, uh, <laughs> it's um, and portraiture is something I continue with personal projects and also portrait commissions. And the whole portrait commission thing actually brought me full cycle uh, all the way back to the Oceanographic Museum um, after pursuing many different portraits of local artists and sculptors and musicians. Um, the museum a couple of years ago commissioned me to do a painting of the administrators. Now the, the tradition of painting portrait is obviously a, a, pretty, a pretty old one, but it's, um, 
it's kind of in fashion or out of fashion, depending on what country you're in and depending what sort of social groups you're in. And I was really surprised that the museum took it upon themselves to reignite the sort of um, historic tradition. Now, the last time the museum ever commissioned a painting like this was in 1909. Um, back then, there were just seven administrators. And here there are 13. And it's painted in the context of the museum. Uh, we set up this whole thing. It took 10 men to carry that table up to this floor. Uh, they, were, they were not wow. happy with it. But, um, so the whole setup was done as you see it. And then uh, different people came to pose at the studio for different, because some of the people were missing from the actual photo shoot the, 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 on the day. Unfortunately, it, it had to be done from a photograph because all these people are not available all the time. So uh, a photographer friend of mine, who's much more of a sort of a classical natural light photographer um, was the one I chose to help me out with this. Cause I really needed to make the, the photograph look like a painting before I even started uh, putting it onto canvas. Mm -hmm. And so the prince is in the middle, by the way. So he's, he heads the museum. It was his great grandfather who founded the museum. Is uh, the painting, but over our shoulders, we're going to go full cycle back to Louis Tiner, who's the painter who inspired me from this painting in, in the Arctic. If you look over on the right of my head, there's a painting on the wall there. That is somewhere we've been all together. Now, you might recognize this particular fjord. I'll come back to it later and tell you exactly where we are. But um, this was one of the paintings that inspired me. Um, early on and, um, and took me to, to the Arctic with you guys. Um, you recognize our friend Freckles? Yes. <laughs> now this, you know, this trip was really something that pushed me to my limits. Um, I had to react, uh, as, as all of us had to react every day to uh, all sorts of conditions. We had to work out where the animals were gonna be, what the weather was gonna be. Um, and so, you know, at every single moment, I had to basically get either drawings, uh, drawing sketchbook or charcoal, or get my oil paints, depending on how much time I was going to have. Uh, sometimes it was just capturing a napping polar bear. Um, this, was, this was one of the polar bears that we saw who just caught a, um, uh, a seal. And um, it finally sat still and actually just napped for a while, while it was trying to digest. And this was my, uh, my first occasion to uh, to paint an actual polar bear from life That's great. the outdoor conditions were were fun i mean i don't mind painting in the cold uh i painted quite a bit in the cold in the alps here uh but you know it takes it takes a bit of use getting used to it and you can't you can't stay out there too long um now this is in uh, fugul uh, fugulfjord i believe um this was a special day. Um, Michael, you organized one day and you reserved a special island for the artists to go and draw. Um, and uh, three of us got plopped on this little island and, um, and left to our own devices. It was great. <laughs> this, was a, this was a 3D map I found. I wanted to put it into context. So this was the little place we were, we were plopped up on. Um, <laughs> the view the view of the glacier that i was painting there on the on the bottom that's the view we had that's neat <laughs> it was um you know the this this bleakness of the arctic was really interesting to try and capture how the how the mountains start disappearing into the mist uh, but somehow these glaciers you know the i learned when i was with you guys that the the blue the intense blue in that ice is is from how the pressure is pushed out all the air bubbles and you end up with this uh, crystal clear kind of ice that just um, has this blue intense glow to it. Um, I remember looking into it when we were told how long these glaciers have been flowing. It's almost like looking back in time. You look at the face of this glacier and you're looking at hundreds and sometimes thousands of years back in time. It's, um, it's pretty impressive. Breaking out the pastels when I've got a bit of time. Um, one of the encounters we had, this was done half from life and then half from um, some of the photographs I took, but I was doing it on board, I think. Um, 
one of the possibly one of the days when we couldn't go out so I spent some time indoors. This is an overview of some of the places we saw in Svalbard. So the paintings on the top are the from the pack ice area and the lower ones are from the actual the actual spots. So the pack ice I think we we got to 83 degrees north and that's where we started just encountering um, the pack ice and that's where we saw the polar bears um, mostly. The Svalbard region was mostly glaciers and uh, peaks, which, uh, which made you know, really interesting graphic compositions as well. The Greenland section was fun too. The, that was um, a lot of mountains, a lot of glaciers, a lot of icebergs floating about. So this, the, the collection here is really depending, um, all the different styles depend on the time frame that's available. So the drawings in the sketchbook are uh, with pencil and that's when I've got the least possible time. So it could be a sketch that might take 20 minutes, 30 minutes. If I know I've got a little bit more, maybe at least an hour, then I can pull out the charcoal and the white chalk, uh, or the pastels, like the two, two drawings at the top, the top corners. Otherwise, if, if I know I've got two hours at the most, then I can actually commit to paint. Um, it takes a little bit more time to get prepared, to get set up. So, I sort of juggle those three different styles really to, to, to fit any possible moment we could, um, we could, we could work with. So this, you know, I'm, I'm not unique in having been to the Arctic to paint. This is Louis Tiner in the Arctic in 1906. Um, he went with Prince Albert the first on two trips to the Arctic. He also did quite a few other trips uh, across the world, but the two in the Arctic were particularly interesting to me. I was a little bit disappointed, Michael, that I didn't get my personal um, porter when I was out. And, <laughs> um, and also an endless supply of cigars, apparently, um, just to keep him warm. And the guy, so the wall you see on the right is actually built by the assistant to make wow. sure that Tiner didn't have a draft in his back. Um, um, I'm even wondering if it was made also to even capture light and heat to sort of generate sort of a miniature radiator. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, next time, next time, Michael, I'd next like- Next time, uh, next time. Sorry, I was busy playing violin and freezing my fingers off, sorry. <laughs> yep. we'll, we'll have, a, we'll have a, a, a competition for photographer to take picture of the artists. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, the po best portrait of the art of art of traveling artists with us. Right, good. <laughs> so yeah, here's Tina in the pack ice area, like uh, like we were. He was actually just actually sitting there. His, his materials are pretty much, pretty much the same as, as what I've got. A wooden box, oil paint, brushes, um, nothing, nothing that different. And I looked, at, uh, I looked at his work, so there were some interesting comparisons also of the receding glaciers. Um, so I went back to the museum after my trip. I, I wished I'd gone there before the trip and found out more about the places he'd been. Uh, we've, we've actually been to the same spots. So this is a bay of Smearenburg. This is the north, uh, northwest corner of Svalbard. So the pastel, the color pastel on the left of 1906, that is from Tinea, the black and white one is the one I did in 2015. And the two maps, the map on the left at the bottom is Prince Albert's map um, with his team that they drew out uh, during their trips. And you can see the line where the glacier is and you can see today's Polo Institute map where the glacier has receded. And so visually it's interesting too to have a an actual, um, actual artist's view, an artist's, uh, not even interpretation, but an artist's record of being as faithful as possible to nature and seeing the different, the different uh, position of the glacier there. So we have, what, what struck out to me is I saw that the little point on the right triangular mass of rock, that little point at the bottom is almost submerged in Tinel's version because the glacier comes up. So you can see that curve at the bottom, the wall we saw, is obviously the erosion uh, section of the glacier carving through. And it's a, it's a long way back, 100 years, pretty much. Wow. And this is uh, the Lillybrook Fjord. This is another spot where you see the recession of the glacier because it's all in water. So the, obviously the, the water, water temperature is making them retreat. This is the fjord as far as I can remember. This is a fjord where we stopped off and went up to see the German Second World War meteorological outpost. Um, 
So if you look at the painting at the bottom, you can see the boats on the far right there. That's their boat that they would come up from, from the Mediterranean all the way up to uh, Svalbard. This is the wall of the glacier back then, and that's the wall and mine. So those two peaks there in the circles, those are the landmarks. Wow. So our ship was actually moored in, in the ice area uh, of huh. Tineo, and that's the view I did from the ship. Um, Tineo obviously never was able to access that far down the fjord. Wow. So these were two, two very specific points that I managed to compare my work with Tineo's work and see um, now, what, something I did actually notice, which was interesting, um, all the views that Tiner painted had mm -hmm. less snow on the peaks, but bigger glaciers. We had smaller glaciers and more, uh, and more snow on the peaks. Um, so there was kind of, I don't know, it, it's probably just up to season, I have no idea, but I don't remember what season he went up there. Um, mm. But there was sort of a, an interesting um, opposite sort of condition there. Yeah. So that's the collection of the charcoal drawings I did when I was up there. Um, they are really all designed to understand form and light. This is where I'm not really concentrating on um, on color. This is the the part that I've the the, the time constraint constraint where I've got maybe half an hour, forty five minutes. These are these are about twenty by thirty centimeters, um, and they help me to understand light structure. Um, form, atmosphere, without the distraction of color. And um, funny enough, some of the photographers, some of the uh, uh, Ernie Brooks, for example, who's who's you know loves black and white photography, he looked at these straight away and was like, oh, it's kind of reminding him of the black and white sort of uh, photographs. Yeah. So sometimes comfortable in uh, indoors, painting the the cold Arctic outdoors. So these are the color sketches that I would do at any moment, whenever the light was, I remember this, this particular moment, I remember I was, in the, I was in the bar area reviewing some of my drawings or uh, preparing some of my work. And then I looked out the window and saw the light bouncing around the ice, something I'd never seen before. And I just rushed to my cabin, grabbed my paints, uh, ran up to the, um, to the control deck or the, the captain's, um, captain's level. He was generous enough to let us hang out there. Um, and just had to try and paint you know, this as quickly as I could. Now, bringing that stuff back to the studio, I then use all these various um, elements that I did up there, uh, the charcoal drawings, the, the paintings, um, and try and combine them into something that can bring uh, a, larger, a larger impression, like the painting that's over my shoulder um, in the studio. But the... Uh, so the sketches from there then lead up to something more final. So these are the enlargements where I'm pushing, pushing some of the detail further, some of the impressions um, into more varieties, even including some, um, some polar bear tracks. <laughs> yeah. So painting these back in the studio was a lot of fun. It, if the Arctic trip was already exciting as it was, painting these back in the studio was almost like being back uh, back up there, it was it was um, it was really interesting to actually get back into the whole atmosphere of the whole thing. The Kings Bay uh, enlargement too was was a lot of fun. This was um, this was one of the early paintings that I did on the trip. This I think Kings Bay was where everybody was testing out their buoyancy in the in the bay. Yes, <laughs> and I, I got onto the top of the ship and just started painting this view. So this is the enlargement from that. And I really started enjoying painting these glaciers. It's uh, there's something about all the different textures and colors. So you've got the you've got that intense blue in that compression area in the crevasses where the blue sky is sort of reflecting into the crevasses, making this this glow. Then you have some of those purple stripes on the right, which is basically accumulated dust and dirt um, and gravel and whatever. And then those get separated into clean little cuts when the glacier starts breaking up. So you've got this really nice clean blue in between there. So being up there was a lot of fun. Um, connecting and talking to all of you who have been doing this for uh, most of your life. Some of the people there that, that that's basically what they do, you know, just always out 
um, engaging with nature, engaging with exploring new places. Um, it made me it made me realize that you know it kind of rekindled an interest in those early days of um, of observing nature, of being in love with the natural sciences, and it brought me to research a little bit more of how science and conservation has been tied with artists uh, in the past. So the, um, this is Carl Akeley. I don't know if you've heard of him. This, he's, he worked for the American Museum of Natural History. He was a photographer and a sculptor and kind of an explorer. He was sort of almost the equivalent of Prince Albert, II, uh, Prince Albert I in the sense that he was exploring and trying to bring back uh, animal specimens for the sake of science, for the sake of public education. Um, and uh, he, he wanted to bring back basically to the people the actual experience and the beauty of the natural world. And unfortunately, photography has its limits. So not to say that photography is a monkey's game, but it's... Um... <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's not what you're trying to say at all. No. no. no, no <laughs> That's what he said. Um, <laughs> but um, he needed painters. He found that photography, obviously black and white photography back then, and uh, even color photography today has its limits when actually trying to reproduce the experience of actually being in a place. And Carl Akeley was also the guy who revolutionized taxidermy. So there's definitely a, a, an era before Carl Akeley and an era after Carl Akeley. Um, I mean, it's, it's day and night. You cannot look at um, pre-Akeley taxidermy without laughing your head off. Um, and, you know, just, just everything about the dioramas before Akeley were, were just laughable. Um, the, the posing, the, the, the technique of taxidermy in itself, the painting in the background, the, the strange inclusion of a bunny rabbit in the middle of the savannah. <laughs> right. Um, I have no idea what's going on there. Um, now, Akeley was, was a sculptor and he understood how you had to sculpt the underneath of the structure before laying upon it the skin of the animal. And, and then he needed also a convincing background. He needed something to actually complete the illusion. Um, so this is where Carl, Carl Akeley needed the most uh, technically skilled painters to be able to actually fulfill the whole mission of bringing nature to people's doorstep. So the, um, the, the expeditions were, were designed so that Carl Akeley could get the specimens. So they go out, they would hunt the number of animals that they needed to, um, to then make whatever diorama was planned back in the museum. And on the same expeditions, the painters would have to accompany them. So this is William Lee and a student of his from New York, Janssen. This is in Central Africa. And they would be there for several weeks. Um, I reckon up to a month. This is uh, the 1920s. So you can imagine how difficult it was to get to these places back then. Um, I think it took them two weeks to get to the location. So um, the ship, the, they, would, they would sail all the way to South Africa. And then from South Africa, push on through northwards uh, up into Central Africa. And they would, um, they would be painting everything they could. Uh, it didn't matter what was, um, what was needed. They just tried to accumulate as much information as possible. Because as you can imagine, if they got back to the museum and they were missing something, it's not as if they could just, oh, let's just go back tomorrow. So they had to do, they had to paint every possible little detail, uh, even just you know, like a corner of a rock, um, the side of a bush just to make sure that they've got all the right light effect to, to do them back, um, back in the studios. And these paintings that they were doing out in the field, these are them in the flesh. These are actually at the Explorers Club. So the Explorers Club purchased these paintings uh, years ago. These are the original paintings that are actually done, the low one in the Serengeti. This was William Lee's painting. And these paintings would be done on the spot and then directly um, influence the structure of the, the backgrounds in the museum. So the, the two top ones are in the jungle of the Belgian Congo and the lower ones are the plains of the Serengeti. And the lower one, you can see that 
the tree on the left, which is closer to us, and then the tree on the right panel, which is further away, they get translated into the diorama, into one tree, the closer one is actually sculpted into an actual physical tree. And then the background one is painted and everything in between is sort of seamlessly arranged so that the illusion you know, just works. And one of my favorites uh, is one of my favorite painters there's James Perry Wilson. He was trained as an architect early on and accumulated um, the sort of technical knowledge of how to construct a space. And then on top of that, he learned how to paint. So he was sort of perfectly skilled for this sort of thing. Here he is in, um, uh, I think the top one is in North America. I think he's doing the bison, the bison view. <clears throat> um, and the lower one is another North American view. And you see him here with his sketch and then painting the wall under the lighting with the animals there so that he can actually make everything work. He can look at how the lighting functions and how the illusion actually, uh, actually gets, gets the audience to understand the whole, uh, the whole atmosphere. Now, I don't know if, I, I guess both of you have been to these dioramas. I don't know, Michael, if yeah. you've been to see them. Um, it's, it's like going out, it's like going traveling. You go to this museum, you sit in these dark hallways and the, the illusion is, is unbelievable. Um, one of my favorites is this one of the Yellowstone National Park. Mm. It's, it's incredible. When I show these in a lecture and trying to get students to guess where the end of reality is and where the beginning of the illusion is, it's, it's so difficult to actually work it out. Yeah, these really are amazing. Could spend a lot of hours <laughs> looking yeah. at these. Right? Yeah. I mean, it, this is sort of the interplay between, um, between science and conservation and art, the, the whole structuring of it is, a, is such an undertaking. Will, Belmore Brown was uh, going off on expeditions in Alaska to paint these backgrounds and then help the assistants to do the final touches in the, in the museum. You know, behind the scenes, you have sculpture, engineering, painting, and all together coming together in this unbelievable illusion of being out there and cleverly sort of arranging little patterns in the foreground so they follow the patterns in the painting, um, obscuring certain areas with grass to make you not see the transition. Now these are, you know, these are some of the big obvious examples of science and art. Um, and it got, me, it got me researching some other painters too. Abbot Thayer is an American painter and Norman Wilkinson is a British painter. Uh, Abbot Thayer was sort of a, a portrait painter uh, landscape painter, but very interested in the natural sciences as well, and really interested in the, the, um, the theory of camouflage. And he actually pushed forward the concept of observable camouflage to, uh, to, a, to a, a further degree with his studies. Some of these illustrations he did were just, just beautiful to look at and so cleverly put together. So you can see the, you can see the peacock hiding in the jungle there on the left and the thrush in the woods on the right. He started observing the whole phenomenon of concealment in the animal kingdom and did, a, and did something that basically scientists couldn't do because he was a painter understanding the dynamics of light and form and could actually directly paint this stuff to explain uh, some, some aspects of camouflage that were a little bit missing in some of the science um, uh, hypotheses. Norman Wilkinson was on the other hand, um, a regular painter, a regular sort of illustrator who was involved in, in this particular case, sort of promotional posters for tourism in Britain. Uh, really kind of really attractive postcardy sort of uh, paintings. But they were both also at some point of their life involved in collaborating scientifically with different aspects of um, visual dynamics. So Abbot Thayer was one of the first uh, people who was putting forward the idea of camouflage in World War I and doing illustrations to show you know, how it functions, why it would be good. It seems obvious to us today, but back then, you know, it, was, it wasn't so obvious and he had to actually make illustrations to sort of describe the pros and cons of it. And Norman Wilkinson, he is responsible for the amazing dazzle camouflage phenomenon of the Second World War. This was, um, this was amazing. This was a, a small episode in the Second World War 
It didn't last too long, although statistically there were less ships that were sunk this, uh, because of this. Um, this was a technique of basically concealing the silhouette of an object by creating abstract shapes which would confuse the human eye to such an extent that when the enemy would see the ships, they had no idea if the ship was going forward, going backwards, if there were two ships, if there were three, was it a warship, was it a, um, a supply ship, was it, uh, was it a fishing boat? And, I mean, it was, uh, it was such an amazing thing to see out on the sea, I'm sure. But it didn't last, unfortunately. The, um, it, intuitively, it didn't make sense to people, and they abandoned the idea. Although, as far as I understood, statistically, it actually improved uh, the chances of boats. But Well, say. luckily for us, we've hung on to one of these, and that's the ship that we're going to be taking to the Antarctic in 2022. <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> it really confused those penguins. So <laughs> confused. <laughs> Nice. Um, yeah, and the, and the idea of camouflage is also something I, I find fascinating. Um, and also species diversity, the, the aspect of uh, evolution, how all these different patterns exist in different places in the world. Uh, and when you get to study something really closely, like here I wanted to see what the differences were, obviously patterns with different big cats. But as I started drawing these, we all assume the cats have the same skull structure. but the more you look at each individual species, it's amazing how all the different fluctuations of and extensions of nose structure, forehead, chin. Um, it's really amazing that the more you draw something, the more you start having a deeper understanding of, of what really lies underneath the, uh, the surface. Um, and also when you, when you start studying insects, that's where the diversity on the planet becomes the most, uh, the most obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those diversity. insect pages are great. <laughs> so, you know, when I, when I draw something, it's really important for me, for example, when I was on the Elysium trip, to actually take my stuff with me instead of just taking a camera and then hoping that I can do stuff from my photographs back in the studio. Now, I'm not a trained photographer. Uh, I trained as a painter. So I want to put those skills, obviously, to practice, but also the whole, the whole process of drawing something and spending time analyzing the forms that are in front of you really get you to sort of understand a deeper, uh, a deeper meaning of your, of your subject. Which is why when I thought I wanted to do some painting of sea lions, I reckon, well, I have to get in the water with them and I have to draw them underwater. So this was probably one of the more challenging projects I've taken on in recent years, uh, drawing underwater. So, it was a bit of a complicated process. So this is in Mexico, the Sea of Cortez. Um, twice I've been now. Um, Alex and Joanna Lentini were our um, guides and organizers. And we spent, uh, I think, about a week or 10 days on each trip. Um, and I had to sort of improvise what I was going to be working with. So I couldn't take my sketchbook underwater. I couldn't take my pencils. And I had to work out the the raw materials of what I was going to be um, faced with. So, um, so I looked at scuba divers so that uh, sometimes have a little small slate on their forearms to take notes. I don't know if you guys have those. I, I don't think I've seen you with little slates to take notes. Um, but I know marine archaeologists, for example, have them to take notes and they even have larger things to draw sort of um, excavation sites. Uh, underwater engineers also take notes to sort of communicate with other divers. And so I just had to find some plexiglass. So I followed the same idea basically as these um, uh, marine uh, archaeologists. And I got some plexiglass, which I prepared specially so I could draw on it. And um, so the other thing that's waterproof is wax. So that's what I was going to be drawing with. And I accumulated all these different bits and pieces. And and had a go. First day, first day, I just took it easy. Um, <laughs> I just hopped in with the fish. Uh, I didn't want to get totally overwhelmed with the first time seeing sea lions underwater and losing all my gear all over the place as I get super excited. So first day, we're well, just taking it easy. Um, I wasn't sure yet of the buoyancy issues of my gear either. So I just wanted to have a little practice run. But as it was fine, as the week went on, then I jumped in with the sea lions and spent pretty much the, the next week drawing every day. 
So only snorkeling, the, the action with these guys happened at the surface for me. Um, the divers had plenty of fun with them down below too, but I certainly wasn't missing out being a snorkeler. They were definitely quite curious with what I was holding, why I was just um, floating in one place for a long time, doing nothing it seemed. And these drawings were really simple. These are very, uh, these are drawings that are basically just capturing a movement, capturing a moment that I, that I feel is going to be interesting to work with later. Um, the panels are pretty tricky to work with because I've sorted out the waterproof side of things. But the thing is, because they're waterproof and I'm using wax pencils, every line is definite. So I can't rub anything out. So as I'm seeing the animals move in front of me, I've got to, I've just got to commit. I've just got to have a go. And I mustn't worry if I fill out the one page with a, loads of mistakes or crappy drawings, it doesn't really matter. Um, I turn it over, I find another spot on the page and fill that up with another drawing. So every line was immediate. I had to capture these things that were moving nonstop. And with all those drawings, I then brought them back to the studio then started studying a little bit more the uh, the nature, the anatomy, of and I used so we play some of the so I would actually experience the uh, experience the gestures again, and which would confirm my my first. Um, my first impression. Um, and then these would get developed further. And obviously, I'd, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna mention the, um, the cormorants made an appearance on my second trip there. That was a lot of fun. They were unbelievable. Um, I almost started ignoring the sea lions when the, uh, when the cormorants turned up. They're really fun to, to chase around. Well, I mean, I wasn't chasing them around. It, it's fun to watch them chase everything else around. Um, so with all these different characters uh, that I was observing, the idea was to try and make a painting of it back home. And the first transition is from the sketchbook to a first drawing composition, which is my first attempt at um, trying to understand what sort of atmosphere I'm going to create, what kind of composition, what sort of design. Things are quite rough at this stage, mostly just trying to get the placement of things. So you can see the cormorants at the top there coming in from the top and then several sea, sea lions creating their signature little globes as the sardines are escaping in all sorts of directions. So the sardines in this particular view, you know, I mean, the, it's overwhelming group of sardines here. It looks like, it looks like a bait ball from South Africa, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's more of uh, sort of using the sardines basically to sort of illustrate the idea of how all these things are dancing together. Yeah, your sardines were all in La Paz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's why we didn't see any. Yeah, they were hanging out with me. <laughs> yeah. So from, uh, from this stage, so this is already as big as I want the painting. And then moving into the, the oil painting, and these are all the, these are details from the large painting. So moving into getting some detail into the, uh, into the movement of the sardines, uh, the gestures into the different animals, and the main, the main protagonist being the main sea lion chasing after the group that's closest to us. And all of that together uh, with the sardines as well. These are, these are the little guys that are escaping at the bottom of the painting. Um, so they're, they're starting to disappear into the dark and just with these little highlights, that's the way I'm, I'm making these, these sardines still um, make sense to the viewer. Because as they go down, um, they start disappearing into the darkness. You've got angel fish up in the, the coral edges as well. One of the one of the only moments in the painting where there's any red or orange. But you have to sort of balance out those warms and cools to not make the painting sort of overwhelmingly uh, overwhelmingly blue. And that is the the work in progress at the moment. Still got a few things to finish, but that is the that is the almost finished result of all that work. So the format here is enlarged uh, widthways a little bit just to give a bit more breathing space to the sea lion and the sardines. But the general structure is still there, you know, that's still the outcrop of the, of the coral is still there. 
the cormorants are coming down a little bit more clearly in this part. Um, and so I'm still I'm still working on this. Still got a few little things to to finish off. Um, but ultimately, you know, this has been probably the, the, the biggest challenge as far as trying to go straight from drawing something in nature that's moving, that's in, a, in an inconvenient uh, place, like underwater. Well, inconvenient for me, not inconvenient for the sea lions, obviously. Um, but the, the whole challenge of being able to go through all those stages and making sure that I'm committing to drawing from life. For me, that's a really important aspect of, of that whole process of being in the place, experiencing it for yourself. And I really think that's the only way you can, you can possibly start communicating any sort of sentiment, any sort of feeling to anyone else to sort of either encourage them to fall in love with these things for the sake of conserving, conserving them better, um, educating people about animal behavior, educating people about um, animal environments. So, I think you know the the secret is always to to be in the place and to to live it otherwise otherwise it won't be it won't be as contagious um, I think um, and I think a, a lot of a lot of the research I've done looking into how uh, scientists and conservationists have called upon artists to get involved in this has has really sort of uh, done done this sort of full circle with me from my early inspiration with Tiner at the Oceanographic Museum and getting on the Elysium trip and discovering the sort of um, sort of extent to which you all, you all go to get your message out there and, and seeing how um, I fit into that little, I fit into my little piece into that huge wheel, you yeah? know? Um, so there you go, guys. That's, um, that was sort of my, my overview of what, uh, what my small contribution um, can be. Um, <clears throat> I love the sea lions. Ah, they're fun to look at. Thanks. Yeah, I like all the sketches in, well, your sketchbook of all the, the sea lion postures and positions because they really just never stop moving long enough to notice, but. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a question. So you, 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 you can draw those, uh, record those movement but how do you re remember like uh, the light source and the intensity of, intensity of lights? How do you remember it when you go back to the studio and, and draw just, just from your own perspective? You, you, you remember it? How, how do you actually put in a light source in there? So I use, uh, I use some of the film footage, like I was saying, um, for, for, to complement the, the, the missing gaps. But um, it's interesting how much my memory was was definitely needing to dominate the images I had on film or photograph because the camera wasn't picking up on exactly the same impression I remembered. So I had to I had to juggle with some of the some of the photo references I had because I knew they were they were distorted. They were either overexposed or underexposed. You know, the, the, depending on what's in the frame, something is going to uh, mess up with the the general atmosphere. So a lot of my memory actually was. Um, sufficiently accurate for me to to get that 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 sort of light um, that light effect. All right. So it's more like uh, like photographers now work with uh, raw raw uh, recording. So it's a it's a raw file, mm -hmm. but we still when we could do a pose, we interpret that the the, the the variation of lights and also the hues of lights. Is that what you what you do as well? Yeah. So you gotta you gotta choose. Um, what we talk about in painting, you have to key your painting. Um, this is not the same as keying a car. That's, that's not nice. Um, keying a painting is the idea of like keying a piece of music. You have to either choose what end of the spectrum of light you're going to be juggling with. So my limited experience with photography uh, has shown me that, you know, the camera will take certain decisions for you, depending on what end of the, you know, what, what, your, what your subject is doing. If your camera is getting blinded by the sun, all your subject matter is going to look black in silhouette. Right. Yet the human eye has the added sophistication of being able to juggle, uh, juggle and make decisions because your brain is making those decisions. And so the advantage you have when you don't have a camera and you're relying on your visual memory is that you can, uh, you can break beyond those limitations that a lens and a box are giving you. Um, so 
you, you have the luxury of making a few more choices. Within those choices, you then have to choose uh, another thing. You have to choose whether you are going to go for something that is all about light or is it all about form? So if I had to completely respect the actual light condition that was there, um, some, of the, some of the forms on the cormorants, for example, if I go to those details, go back to those details, um, some of the forms on the cormorants we wouldn't see. That would just be a completely black silhouette. Right. But in paint, I can actually afford to modulate all those things so it actually replicates a little closer to what we would see with the naked eye um, rather than the, the blinded effect that the camera would get, if that makes sense. Yep, sure. So this, this series is, is still a, a work in progress, you're saying? Yeah, the painting is still in progress. I've still got a few more things to finish off on the lower part of the painting. There's another sea line at the very bottom of the painting in the darkness. Mm. And I still need to resolve um, him and also some of the other parts on the lower left where the sardines are going off to the shoulders. Um, where, where are this going after this when it's finished? Uh, it's going to the highest bidder. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. um, this, uh, I mean, for now, this has been more of an experiment to try and see if I can actually manage to, to, to make sense of all those different stages from working in the field and then bringing it all into the studio. Um, so for now, I mean, it will be exhibited uh, at my next uh, exhibition that I'm, uh, I may organize in Monaco. Um, obviously, you know, for now, exhibitions are kind of off the, um, off the agenda, but... Um, yeah. These, uh, this is my first attempt and I'd like to try more because, you know, an experience of a place gives you, uh, gives you a myriad of options. This is my first option, my first attempt. And as I paint something, usually I'm thinking, oh, I know, I should have done a different, maybe I should do a, another composition. And, you know, things, things move into your brain organically as you're working on something. Um, you make a good front cover of Ocean Geographic magazine. <laughs> well, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like All it. Right. That, I was, like that it. was uh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Toby. I think uh, you have to come back with us to. I need to talk to you about uh, 2022. <laughs> yes, right. Sure. You have, uh, and, you have and, a, and apparently, and yes. I said, and apparently, Jen Hayes needs to talk to you about uh, framing some of your paintings that they have. <laughs> okay, good. Sure. Yeah, she needs. She says she needs advice or contacts on how to present the art properly. So, okay, sure, fix it. <laughs> well, Jen, I'll be in touch. And uh, all right, Jen, your talk with David was fascinating. I loved watching that one. That was really cool. Yeah, that was so, a good one. Very oh well, you'll have to go through the comments on here. They're all really cool, and some of them are from uh, our Arctic expedition. Oh, uh, remember Anya? She yes, yep. is watching. Yeah, so great, that's great. nice. Hello, Anya everyone. is coming on the, uh, Anya will be with us for the 2022 trip as well. Oh, good. Yeah, she, she's, she's not, she's got promoted to a guide now. Awesome. Oh, yes. Cool. Oh, that's so fun. Fantastic. So Toby, it's, uh, very nice to have you with us and uh, we should talk more of uh, uh, 2022 and the, the next Elysium trip. Absolutely. Look forward to it. I'll bring my glass. Uh, Alex, anything? <laughs> uh, no, everyone was just commenting. So yeah. <laughs> Super. Okay, you, you'll have to go through them. Okay. Great, Thanks so much. Great. Bye. See you soon. <laughs> Bye. See you back in the water, hopefully. You bet. Right. Oh. <laughs>